your heart this morning and Miss Connie, can you say amen? Amen. Amen. What a deal. Uh, Brother Ronnie's got a computer, right? Got a computer? Hi, Brother Ronnie. See what you're missing? <laughs> I'm not pushing you. You guys get to feel a better. Amen. All right. Peyton, good to see you. Y'all pray for him. He's got a ball game Tuesday in Wright City. Two games Tuesday, not Tuesday. Two games Tuesday. Y'all pray for him. Ask the Lord to bless him and then beat your socks off of Wright City. <laughs> <laughs> Play them both at the same time. Merritt, you mean this morning. Honorary thing. Uh, for those of you that like car shows, Brother Dave, I'm hoping that I get to make it to him. He and Brother Walt are going to be up at uh, Petty Jean Mountain at Marlton. They're having a big one up there on the 23rd. If you like car shows, I hope, hope you're able to go. September the 23rd. So, anyway, amen. He's got me started on that stuff. I enjoy it. I really enjoyed that rod running then. That was cool. That was cool. So a 1938 Packard. And uh, Brother Dave said the guy had to have a half a million dollars in it. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a scratch on that thing. It was beautiful and all the chrome. Uh, it excites old country boy. But amen. Y'all think about that. I invited my son. I told Charlie and Emily about that. And hopefully they'll be able to take the kids over there too to see that so amen how many of you got to go to the county fair some of you none of you it was pretty good wasn't it it was pretty good i got there one day late i missed the chickens <laughs> i like to look at the bandy chickens and they were already gone i was so sad so old daryl went and got me a turkey leg that weighed about 14 pounds I don't know what kind of turkey they got that thing off of, but I wouldn't want to make it mad. <laughs> I'm not telling you, that turkey leg was that long and that big around. I think they sold us a bunch of emus. <laughs> <laughs> that turkey was big. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let me calm down here a little bit. All right. Uh, Brother Peyton, would you ask the Lord to bless our offering this morning? Remember our missionaries in your prayers too. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for being blessed, Lord. Pray that you be with everybody in prayer this, Lord. Thank you for keeping everybody safe as we come here this morning, Lord. Pray that you be with Ronnie and Mom, Lord. Pray that you be with everybody as we go home, Lord. And pray that you bless this offering, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 question with a question was Matthew Mark Luke and John Old Testament was it all right now I'm going to turn you to Hebrews chapter 9 and I want you to look at this with me now we know that every Bible you ever get a hold of is going to have New Testament stamped on that section of the Bible 
at the beginning of Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. I know that. Now, a lot of the reason that that's that way is because you're changing from Hebrew to Greek. So a lot of people began to get the idea that the New Testament began in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. Well, it did not. It did not. I think some of these things would be surprising, but hopefully a blessing to you, too. Hebrews chapter 9. So that's, you know, some of these things can cause problems. Um, and we're going to try to, we're working with that. Now, don't forget on Sunday night, we've been working with the Hebrew epistles. That's what it has, the epistles. That, all these words, it's kind of hard. <laughs> Amen, brother. It's kind of hard, but... All that means is letters. So we're going to look at the Hebrew letters. I'm, I'm studying and trying to bring some lessons on Hebrews through Revelation. You've got Hebrews, James, definitely, he says who's his to, his is to, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. All right, that happened in Acts chapter 8. He's not talking to the body of Christ, per se, okay? Then you've got, what, First and Second Peter? Then you've got First, Second, and Third John. Then you've got Jude and Revelation. And I would venture to say that the, the body of literature there is less known to the church, the body of Christ, than many other passages, even the Old Testament. I think some people are more familiar with Isaiah than they are with the book of Hebrews. So we're, going to, we're doing some teaching on it. So this, this lesson stems from studies in those Hebrew letters. Uh, so... To, to help you explain why we're going to Hebrews first to talk about what happened in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Hebrews chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 15. Actually, there's an entire lesson in this, uh, just this one verse. Hebrews chapter 9, or these two or three verses. Verse 15, and for this cause, he's talking about the Lord Jesus in a context of the tribulation. He's writing to people that are trying to get through the tribulation. So uh, Peter, James, and John, all three did that. All right? Why? Because that's what the Lord told them to do. And that's what they told Paul they were going to do. Remember Galatians chapter 2? You go to the heathen and we'll go to the Jew. Right? Yeah. So when they wrote their letters, they didn't write them to the heathen. <laughs> that's us. <laughs> the Gentiles. And there were some of the archies used to say when I was little, the heathens. <laughs> right, Connie? You've heard that term, heathen, uh, with an R. You know. Well, I didn't know it was spelled any other way, but it just turned out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. Okay. And for this cause, he, that is Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament, thank God, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, old, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there is there must also of necessity be the, te the death of the testator. For a testament is of force. A testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lived. Now I'm going to ask you a question in Jesus' case. Was Jesus alive during 27 chapters of Matthew? No. No? Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I'm with Mark. Way over in the book of Mark. He's alive. So the New Testament's not in force. He has to die on the cross, shed that blood to make the New Testament effective. All right. Same as Luke and the same with John. So the teaching that the Lord Jesus did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, not, and John previous to his passion, to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was consequently Old Testament teaching. That's the nature of it. That's what Jesus did. All right. Now, I, I read the hard part of this to understand is some of these preachers has taken what they've read from Paul and superimposed it to the Sermon on the Mount. And they say, this is what Jesus is saying to Christians. Jesus was not talking in Christians in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was talking to Israel in the Sermon on the Mount. 
and the New Testament is not in effect. You just read it. Not till he died on that cross and shed that blood was it available. Okay. Uh, th this Hebrews 9, 15 through 17, explains that it was after Jesus' death on the cross that the New Testament took place, not before. Okay? So if you understand that, that's a good step into learning how to rightly divide the word of truth. Because then you can go and see exactly what Jesus did teach. Let me give you a little snapshot of what Jesus was doing previous to the cross. Look at Romans chapter 15 and verse 8. And again, it's good to see you this morning. I hope you get something today that will bless your life. Romans chapter 15 and verse 8. And I'll guarantee you, the more you understand the Word of God, the more you can open this thing up and read it and just sit down and understand it, it's such a blessing. Romans 15 and verse 8. This is what Jesus was doing. This is Paul telling us what our Savior was doing previous to establishing the New Testament in his blood. He said, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Well, you know who that is. That's Israel. Israel. They all had to get circumcised, the boy babies, on the eighth day. That was the idea. Separate that nation from the rest of the nations of the world, see. No nation has been called upon like that by God to do something religious in the manner of circumcision. It separated them. It put up a wall. It put up a wall, a partition between them and the rest of the world or the Gentiles, the other nations. Okay? He says, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. So that's, that's for sure. Now wait a minute, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the first part. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. God had promised some things. We talked about in our Sunday school class. Jesus never has broken any promise he ever gave you. And he never will. Amen? He promised you that if you trust in what he did for you at the cross, he'd save you. And his consequent resurrection. He did. He's made us promises about our families as Christians. Now, I'm not saying my family's perfect. God knows Brittany ain't perfect. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And she knows old dad isn't perfect. But God has blessed our family. You see? Evie? Where's Evie? Raise your hand, Evie. Amen. Can you say, praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> you see? Now, you've got family members that are blessed because you have been saved, and Jesus promised you to save you. Uh, my brother Ronnie, I was talking to Brother Ronnie this morning, and he said, well, that reminds me, I was talking to him about God keeping his promise. He said that uh, Acts 16, 31, that Philippian jailer, he got saved and his house. I said, that's right, that's right. He, I was encouraging him, and he ended up encouraging me. But it's true. God will bless you and your family. You may not see it all at once. You may not see it all at once. But are you blessed in Dennis? So has God kept his promise? To you? Amen. Okay, see? That's how he does it. Then he gives us the biggest promise of all. Eternal life. Why should we not believe him about that if we can see the evidence and the truth of what he's already done? You see, I want you to leave here today realizing Jesus will never break a promise. He will never, ever break a promise. When you got saved, hey, like it or not, bud, you saved forever. Amen. Amen. Regardless of what the Methodist brethren think. <laughs> and I love them. I love them. All right. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, number one. He's going to fulfill the prophecies. To confirm the promises of See that? Made unto the fathers. God promised Israel that they're going to have a kingdom on this earth and they're going to be in charge of the entire world as a nation under Jesus Christ, Amen. under the Messiah. That's what they were promised in the Old Testament. Well, Jesus came to tell them the fulfillment of that. 
So his preaching talks about that. His preaching, he, he, he's not, he knows he's going to save Paul over here. He's got Paul over here in the wing, and he knows he's going to save him. But first things first, he's fulfilling his promises made to Israel. Let me give you one of the promises, that the babe would be born in Bethlehem. That's Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. That the babe would be born of a virgin. That's Isaiah chapter 7. So you see, all of this, these things, there are still some to be fulfilled. Yes, the physical kingdom on earth. When the Bible talks about a kingdom, it's not talking about a spiritual kingdom all the time. Sometimes it is, but most of the time it's not. It's talking about that kingdom that God's going to give Israel. And Jesus told Israel, look, I'm here. God has fulfilled his promise. I am the Messiah. Now, some of them believed him. The ones that did believe him, he told them some of the strangest stuff. If they're in the church, the body of Christ. Look at Matthew 19 and verse 28. Matthew 19 and verse 28. He told them this. Now, this is a strange thing if you're in the church of body of Christ. These men weren't in that yet. All right, Matthew chapter 19. We talked about this a little bit in our Sunday school class. All right, Peter's asking him, what am I going to get? And these other guys, we've been running around here for a while with you. What are you going to give us? <laughs> I mean, they're just humans. They're not perfect. But there's nothing wrong with asking a question like that. What shall we have? This was what Jesus' answer was to them. Now remember, this is Israel he's teaching. These are the 12 apostles, Jewish, pork abstaining, Sabbath observing, circumcised, bearded, Jewish apostles of Jesus Christ. These are not people in the church, the body of Christ. You with me? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me, right then, in the regeneration, and they've got, Israel's going to be restored in that kingdom. When it comes, when it comes, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, that's explained in the Bible to be David's throne in Jerusalem, not heavenly throne, David's throne in Jerusalem, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So I, I want you to see from that that what Jesus is teaching has to do with national Israel, their leadership during a kingdom, a physical kingdom, on this earth. Now, that's not us. Everybody in the world wants that kingdom. It's not ours. You don't have one square foot of land promised to you in Israel. But the nation of Israel gets the whole thing from the River Nile north to where Noah's Ark landed at Mount Ararat, along the Euphrates River, and across the Arabian Desert. A huge kingdom of Jews. By the way, that takes in all of the Middle Eastern countries that are Muslim and hate the Jews. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? They know about it. They know what they were promised. Whenever those people get to calling the Jews Zionists, that's what they're talking about. All right, but they will get that kingdom, but it's going to take Jesus coming back to give it to them. They're not going to take it by arm, force. And that's not going to happen. Folks, I'm telling you, they're not going to get that kingdom by arm, force of their own. I don't care. I don't care what all kinds of arms they get. They'll neither hold nor keep that land until Jesus comes. When he comes now, they're going to get the land. But it's going to take his power. See? All right. Now, why did Paul write and say that Jesus was a minister unto the circumcision to make promises unto the Father? Or, or to fulfill the promises unto the fathers? Because the Mosaic law was the order of the Old Covenant. And he's teaching Old Covenant things. Now, I'm not going to keep you long today. I'm not going to keep you long. I want to give you these things before you get tired and sleepy. Do y'all need a, you know, we watch so much TV. Here, here we go. Here, I'll give you a little commercial. Pretend this is TV. We're going to get right to the commercial. All right. This is Super Beats. 
you buy this shirt? Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, will, it will help you feel a lot better. You can run and jump and do all this stuff. Just get you some super feet. Order them today. We got them in the shoes. So if you're on the go, just toss one in. Okay. All right. In the commercial. All right. Now we're feeling better. We're back. We're back on the program. All right. Jesus operated because it's previous to the New Testament. Obviously, he hadn't died on the cross. He operated according to the Old Testament. Number one, Jesus was circumcised. Look in Luke chapter set two. All according to the laws of Moses, every bit of it. Now we're not called upon what Paul tell us about circumcision in the church, where circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything. This is not important to us. We're the church, but it's important to those people. So Jesus, as an example, did it. Luke chapter two and verse twenty-seven. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. Now this, this is when Jesus is presented to, at the temple. Simeon was there. They, they're still practicing Judaism full board. So Jesus did everything according to the custom of the law. So he was circumcised when they took him to the temple. Eight days old. Just like every other little Jewish boy. That's the Levitical law. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You're not under the law. We read that in Romans chapter 3 this morning in our Sunday school class. You're not under the law. You don't have to worry about that business. All right? Now, Jesus, well, this is going to shock you, but it's true. Jesus taught conditional forgiveness. Your forgiveness is unconditional. You believe on Jesus Christ, he saves you, forgives every sin. From that time, past present and future. A future one you didn't know about maybe, but it's true. Look in Matthew chapter 6, but to these people, the blood had not been shed, folks. The death of the testator had not taken place. When you turn in these verses, you're turning to Old Testament passages having to do with the law that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Get that. All right? Matthew 6 and verse 14. Statement was that Jesus taught conditional forgiveness during his earthly ministry to Israel. All right, Matthew 6 and verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That doesn't have anything in the world to do with a Christian. You take those sins and you go to that cross, spiritually speaking, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the gospel we preach is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is talking about a legal situation. Had national Israel believed him, they would have went into a kingdom, right? Amen. Well, you don't want them fighting with one another all the time. <laughs> and the Lord said, you forgive those that you... Get. Let's read it again, Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That is not our forgiveness. Remember Colossians 1.14, Paul, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. See? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works like that, lest any man should boast. Why? Because Jesus is talking to Israel. If you'll get that, and you read Matthew through the first 27 chapters, you'll see him doing it. You'll understand your Bible better, okay? He taught Levitical sacrifice for healing. What did he tell this man? Look in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 4. He told this man to go do a Levitical sacrifice under the law of Moses, Harrison, for his healing. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 4. And Jesus said, now he, he now look, let's, let's, let's look what happened. He came down from the mountain there in verse 1, and verse 2, and behold, there came a leper. Leprosy is bad stuff. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of that, but your hand is raw. I mean, it's bad stuff. 
worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. He was considered unclean under the law of Moses. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now, look at the directive that the Lord gives this man who has been healed. Verse 4, all according to the law of Moses. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou, tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest. What, are the Catholics running around here? No! That's a Jewish priest in the temple. Mosaic law. Making this point pretty good, isn't it? Self to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded. That Moses commanded? You mean he's telling this leper to obey Moses' law? Well, I thought we were saved by grace. We're no longer under the law. We're not up to Paul yet. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Lord Jesus Christ taught Old Testament doctrine. Why? Because he's dealing with Israel. Let's get another one. Oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> Offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. All right? He also taught in the book of Mark, chapter 10, that Israel was to follow the commandments of the Mosaic law. Now, that verse had Moses' name in it, that one we just read. So you know what he's talking about to those people. It's not guesswork, folks. It's just a matter of believing what's written on the page. Mark chapter 10. Now, this is all going to change. Jesus' ministry from heaven is, however, different. That's when he starts giving Paul the stuff on grace after he went back to heaven. So he's got the earthly ministry to the Jews, the heavenly ministry to the church, which is the body of Christ, the spiritual. All right? Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. You say, well, I've never heard any of that stuff before. Well, come back to this church. You'll learn your Bible, and you'll feel better about things. I'll tell you something else. Your joy as a Christian will return. You know, whenever you got saved, people couldn't hardly hold you down. I'm saved. You remember calling all them ten folks and all that stuff you were doing, and you are ready to go to church? Do you want that joy back, or do you want them demon-possessed people out there falling after the devil keep messing you up? Don't let them. Bring them to church. We'll get them saved and they'll help you from then on. <laughs> I mean, the Lord will. You know what I mean, maybe. Quit picking on me. All right. <laughs> I love preaching to that guy. I hope he puts up with me. Not at, at him, see. I, I know he didn't do all these things. All right. So, where was I? Follow the commandments. Mark chapter 10. And verse 17, here we go, thank you. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? Very humble. There is none good but one, that is God. Actually, this man was calling him God. Thou knowest the commandments. Now watch this. Folks, just believe your eyes. Believe your heart. Believe your ability to read words. Okay? I didn't like this. But I believe it. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. That's in the law. That's in the ten. Do not kill. That's in the ten. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. So he was a law-keeping Jew. And here Jesus is telling him to keep the law. So what is Jesus teaching? The law of Moses. The New Testament's not a force. This is Old Testament doctrine. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. I know it's difficult because of some of the things you've heard. Some of these brethren tear the scriptures all to pieces. We just find them, believe them and rightly divide them. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. No, 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 no. I'll get Ronnie's verse. Acts 16, 31. Acts 16, 31. See what, see what Paul tells this character here. 
on how to be saved. He sure don't tell him to keep the law. Acts 16, 31. Paul, uh, Paul is talking about what Paul was preaching to them. Uh, let's see, 31. Let's go up a little bit. Uh, this Philippian jailer, just a little background, is fixing to kill himself because he's a Roman uh, guard of a Roman jail, and if they let their prisoners out, they, the Romans would kill them. So he, he's fully convinced he's fixing to die anyway. So he said, but Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, do thyself no harm. He was going to commit suicide. For, and then he goes from that to being saved. So, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. That is, the jailer did that. And brought them out and said, Sirs! Hey, this guy's, this guy's ready for something to happen. He's fixing to kill himself. It's bad. He's in a situation. And he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, remember, keep the laws of Moses and don't steal and honor your parents. He didn't say that. He doesn't say that to you today. God's program is grace today. He said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. See? That's a lot different than telling somebody to keep the laws of Moses. But they're trying to do it. 90% of professing Christians think they're Jews. I keep saying that, and I'm trying to prove it. Folks, I don't want to be a Jew. I want to be a Christian. And Paul says in the book of Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Why? Because I've trusted Christ. I am now a Christian. They tear the book of Romans up trying to explain to Christians that they're Jews. You're not. Okay, you're, 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 if you're saved, you're a Christian. Hey, can y'all say amen? Y'all scare me. <laughs> you're looking at me like, you better get it wrong. All right. All right. He also told them to obey. Now get this. We've got to be careful here. What the Pharisees were saying about the law, which they wouldn't do, but he said to obey what the Pharisees were saying about the law. Matthew 23, about done. Matthew 23. But I want everyone here to get the fact that Jesus Christ was teaching the law in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That changes. Thank God that changes. A person, you can be saved by the grace of God just like that Philippian jailer by simply believing that Jesus died for your sins, went in the tomb, and rose again the third day. See? Thank God. Thank God. All right. And thank God, you know, the old Mosaic law also had food laws, Brother Danny. You couldn't eat catfish or pork. You couldn't have a ham sandwich. I'm glad that's over with, aren't you? <laughs> I'm really glad. Matthew 23 and verse 2, here he is telling them to obey what the Pharisees had said now because they would say and do not, as you'll see from this verse. Matthew 23, I'm getting it, Brother Charlie. 23 and verse 2, <clears throat> saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In whose seat? God, can you all say it? Moses. 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 See the law? See the Ten Commandments? See the other 603? Law. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say, and do not. But he told them what? Keep observing that law. Okay. Then, this is going to be one of the final things. Jesus Christ observed. Now, in the book of Leviticus, you've got seven feasts. You've got seven feasts that the Jews did every year in the book of Leviticus. They're still in there. They've got Passover, they've got unleavened bread, uh, Pentecost, had to do with it. Seven, for, what was the other one? Wave loaves. Wave loaves, yeah, like they were doing at Pentecost. So he observed those feast days. 
Matthew 26 and verse 17. Now, why would he do that if this was New Testament material? It isn't. It's Old Testament. Matthew 26 and verse 17. Verse 17. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, no doubt about it, where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? That's called the Lord's Supper in our vernacular. But he went up there to eat the feast of unleavened bread with his disciples, observing a Jewish feast. Now indeed, that was in preparation for what was coming when he did die on the cross. But they didn't know. Not yet. They didn't know. Look at Luke chapter 9. They were preaching something, guys. What were they preaching? Luke chapter 9. They were preaching a gospel. They were preaching good news. Luke chapter 9. In verse 1. This is what they were preaching. They weren't preaching the death, burial, and resurrection. I'm going to show you they didn't even know what it was. Brother Allen, look at verse 2. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. That's what he sent them out to preach, the kingdom of God. Did they understand about the death, burial, and resurrection? Look at Luke 18. The answer to that is unequivocally no. And Peter gets a good lesson in just firing off your mouth before you think. <laughs> Luke 18. But Peter was like that. I'm not mad at him. Luke 18 and verse 30. 1. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets shall concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated, and spit on him. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Well, you're familiar with that. That's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. That's the gospel we are to preach, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But look at their reaction. These kingdom preachers, Jewish, circumcised, pork-abstaining, Sabbath-observing, temple-worshiping, feast-observing Jews, what was their answer? And they understood none of these things. Well, we do. Why? Because it comes later. God sends Paul, and he helps us begin to understand we're saved by the grace of God. We're not under the law of Moses. Again, Romans 3, 4, 5, and other parts. What have I teach, taught you this morning? I've taught you, I hope, how to understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you understand that 90% of that material is under the law, it won't scare you. Don't try to spiritualize what Paul wrote, bring it in over there, and place it on there like the preachers do. Just believe what you read. Because one of the greatest events is fixing to occur. Jesus Christ dies on the cross, goes in the tomb, rises again the third day, and he ascends back to heaven. Then in Acts chapter 9, he reappears down on this earth in a vision to Paul. Paul is the apostle that we need to listen to. I'm not worried about getting circumcised, whether I am or not. It doesn't matter. I'm not worried about keeping laws of Moses. I'm not worried about making sacrifices in some temple. Why? Because Jesus told Paul, he said, you tell him this. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not yourselves, it is the gift of God. You tell them this. His heavenly ministry is so much different and on purpose. And it has reasons. You see, when I start this whole day out with you guys, I said to you, Jesus will never break a promise. Look. The Old Testament people were promised to kingdom. So, Jesus' death on the cross, not only did he die for the sins of the world, he died for the sins of Israel so they could eventually get into their kingdom. He also died for us.
So that the moment we do like that Philippian jailer and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ at the point, into the body of Christ you come. Now you need to know what verses is in the Bible to help you understand how to be pleasing to God. Not a preacher! Please listen. How to be pleasing to God. Not a preacher. Not a denomination. Because a preacher may be right. He may be wrong. He may be teaching Moses' law to the church members in that particular church. You listen to the word of God, you're going to be all right. Learn how to rightly divide it. The Bible says, and I'll leave you with this, the Bible says the Christians will be joyful. It says we will be joyful. Are you joyful? Simple. Are you joyful? Or does it take something from this world to make you happy? Do spiritual things make you happy? You know, a big reason why a lot of Christian folks aren't joyful because they don't understand lessons like you just got. And these preachers keep putting them back under the law of Moses and tell them they have to perform like a circus cat or something. No, my friend, just believe. Now, the things you're going to do after you're a Christian, we're doing them, but it's not according to law. It's because our hearts have been enraptured by this grace that has been showed us. You'll do more on accident after you understand these things and get saved by the grace of God than you ever could or the Jews ever did. The Bible says in Romans 8 that the law is weak because of the flesh. But your spiritual life is another thing entirely. You can have a complete, happy, joyful Christian life today in 2022 with the Democrats trying to destroy the country. <laughs> You can still have a happy and a joyful life. Hard things happen in this world. Talk to some of your brethren about it. Maybe they have studied it. Other. See, the Bible starts setting up residence in us after they get saved. They've got that in their heart. Maybe share that with you, or you can find it in your Bible. God's for you. Amen. He's not against you. He wants you to be successful. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be fulfilled. He wants you to have a sense of purpose. How many preachers talk like this? Not many. They condemn people all the time. Sometimes I just want to say, now they're my brethren, but you know how it is to have a little brother. Sometimes you just want to share. <laughs> now I know, I know. <laughs> Well, you do. I mean, it's just kind of natural. Right, Kevin? Oh, he's not in here. Right, Ethan? <laughs> okay. So remember, Jesus is for you. Let's all stand. And he'll never, ever break his promises to you. Never, ever. He said, you've got eternal life. You've got eternal life. Those that have gone on before us, those that have trusted in his promises, they haven't been let down. It's like Sister Marcia. That was a blessing this morning. And Brother Kevin's choice of songs. That's a blessing. I'm telling you. It's wonderful to be saved. It's wonderful to serve the Lord. Brittany, if you'll play with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, there might be somebody here that has received the gift of salvation. That's all you do. You receive this mighty gift from God. The only thing that he has
make them real in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. He will make it real to you. Now we can't do that as human beings. As, as gladly as we want to sing and trust in Christ, we can't do that. But we promise you as Christians that if you trust him, he will do everything he promised to do for you. He'll save you. He'll give you a life that has a sense of purpose. He'll give you hope beyond this world. That's our Savior. Oh, we try to lift him up. Not ourselves. Not ourselves. No preacher, no priest, no church can do what only Jesus can do. Let him do it in your life. There are a bunch of people in here this morning if they had the chance to testify, would tell you, yes, that old fuzzy-headed preacher is telling you the truth. He's telling you the truth. Jesus saved me, and he can save you. One more verse, head out into that old world. And I want you to remember the strength you gain from being a member of the church, which is the body of Christ. We don't have you sign anything around here. You just trust Christ and get saved and get in the body. But let's sing this together before we go back out there and start fighting that fight again. Let's sing Amazing Grace, the first verse at least this morning. Let's do the first and last one. Okay? Amazing Grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see the last verse. Say! 